slide. Oh. Shona, um, can I ask you to unshare your screen, Shona? Thank you. Hi. Kia ora, everybody. Uh, welcome to yet another of our um, Deep South Challenge seminars. Uh, we're delighted today to welcome the whole crew from the University of Otago and Shona Mackey in particular uh, to be talking about her work uh, improving um, the New Zealand Earth System model and global climate models in general, in particular the way they handle melting ice in Antarctica, which is obviously um, a critical issue of global concern always, but also in particular this week. So um, I just will have a couple of housekeeping matters for those of you who haven't participated in a Zoom seminar before. Uh, we have, um, we're expecting quite a busy Zoom room today, um, but not such busy physical hubs because of many things that are happening around the Motu. Uh, but if you are in, uh, if you're an individual connected via Zoom, uh, we'll be having questions at the end of the seminar, about 15 to 20 minutes for questions. You can either raise your hand in the chat panel, you can click on your name and raise your hand and we'll be able to see you that way. Uh, or you can type a question in the webinar chat uh, and we will um, answer, ask the questions for you. Um, we're presenting from Niwa in Wellington and Shona's obviously presenting from Otago. So we'll be um, swapping back and forth to facilitate the question time. Uh, if for some reason you can't raise a hand, you can always email me, alex uh, at keeblecommunications.com and I'll be able to ask a question for you. Uh, and just one more notice that the seminar, um, we're, we're coming towards the end of our year uh, for our seminar series. We have two seminars left. Um, the next seminar on October 23rd will be Patrick Walsh from Manaki Whenua talking about his research into flood mitigation schemes. And the last seminar of the year in November will be uh, presented by Belinda Story from Climate Sigma, talking about her work looking at insurance retreat. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Shona and ask her to share her screen again. Thank you very much. Uh, great. Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, thanks very much for, for tuning in to this seminar. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a bit about, about climate models in general and how they work and, and specifically why New Zealand has decided, why we've decided that we want our own climate model, the New Zealand Earth System model. And I'm going to give you some examples of things we're doing with that. And the examples are all going to be, as, as Alex said, involving ice of various forms around Antarctica. So, if I can get this to work. Ah. So, first up is, um, well, what are climate models? So, climate models are essentially a 3D mesh that covers the Earth from the top of the atmosphere to the bottom of the ocean. And inside each grid cell, we store information that describes the state of that cell. So, for example, if we've got a grid cell that's in the ocean, the information in that cell will tell us the temperature of the water, how salty it is, so the salinity, how fast the water is moving, what direction, and how much heat is being received or, or sent outwards from that cell to its neighbours. And that is to neighbouring cells um, above it and below it, as well as next to it. So it's kind of like a, a virtual laboratory for the planet. It's sort of like a, yeah, like a, a, virtual, yeah, a virtual laboratory for the planet. Well, when we run a climate model, what we do is we update this information that's held in each grid cell and we're updating it every, what we call every time step. So usually it's more frequently than once an hour. And that's because we have to do it frequently enough to capture how frequently these things, like the temperature, will change in, in the real world. And once we've got a climate model and we've got it all set up and we've got all the information in place, then we can do experiments with it and we can see how changes that we make in in one piece of information or in one place on the globe affect changes elsewhere so we can look at sensitivities and then of course the other thing we can do which is what people generally think of most with climate models is we can prescribe scenarios of changing greenhouse gases and we can predict what we think the climate will do in the future 
if these changes take place. So typically, we want to run a climate model for hundreds of years. So if you remember, I, I said that it's, uh, <laughs> we want to update the state of every grid cell, usually more frequently than every hour. So that makes a lot of calculations. And that means we produce an awful lot of data, which means we need a really, really big computer. And it's important, this is an important consideration. It's not just a technical thing. Because the fact that we need um, a really big computer and nobody has infinite computing resources means that some stuff has to be left out. We can't, we can't possibly include everything. So we have to decide what, what do we leave out and what do we include in order that we focus on what matters. And what matters is what makes the most difference and has the most impact on the climate. The problem is that what affects the climate in one place and things that are really, really important for the climate in one place might actually make very, very little difference to the climate somewhere else. And this is what brings us on to why has New Zealand decided to start running its own climate model? So not every country in the world has the computing resources to run, uh, to run a climate model. So those that do, every few years, all the modeling groups around the world, we get, we get together and we compare our models. We look at the different climate models and we say, well, where are they doing well? Where are they doing badly? And the last time this happened, almost all of the models were doing pretty badly in the Southern Ocean, particularly around Antarctica with issues like Antarctic sea ice, which is the frozen surface of the ocean. So the plot here shows you the, the red shows you grid cells that are completely covered in sea ice. So that's where the surface of the ocean has completely frozen and the blue is where none of the ocean has frozen. And I've put that circle around New Zealand just to show why New Zealand might be concerned if the climate is not being well represented in the Southern Ocean, because we're pretty close to it. If we're not representing the Southern Ocean very well, then we start to wonder, well, are we representing the climate in New Zealand very well? So that was one reason um, why New Zealand decided to, to start getting involved in running our own climate model. And the other sort of related reason is that we've got a lot of expertise here in New Zealand in understanding what goes on in the Southern Ocean. We've got a really good tradition of making observations and understanding what's going on down there. And now we can use that expertise, we hope, to, to improve the way processes there are represented in the models, because as I say, they were not represented very well. So I'm going to show a video, hopefully, uh, just now. So this video is very short. This is showing the um, frozen surface of the ocean, so the sea ice, the area covered in sea ice around Antarctica on the left and in the Arctic on the right. And um, this is just going through a time series of September from 1979 to 2016. So in Antarctica, this is when we have the, what we call the sea ice maximum, the greatest area of sea ice that is, uh, the greatest area of ocean that is frozen. Whereas in the Arctic, it's the minimum. So it's when, when the least amount of ocean is, is frozen because obviously the seasons are, are opposite in the two hemispheres. But what I want you really to notice is that these are quite different places. So in the Antarctic here on the left, we've got a landmass, pretty big landmass surrounded by ocean. And in the Arctic on the right, we've got an ocean that's surrounded pretty much by land. And this means that processes that are important, so although we've got lots of things the same, we've got the ocean surface freezing and so on, things that are most important to climate in one place are not necessarily going to be the most important things in the other place because they're, they're very different environments. So I'm going to just go back to the presentation, I hope. Uh, here we go. Uh. So I'm going to use an example of a process that isn't fully represented in, in climate models, in the, including in the New Zealand Earth System model, that is pretty important to things that happen in the Southern Ocean and therefore could be pretty important to climate in New Zealand. So I'm going to talk about melting Antarctica. So I have to step back first and explain what this process is um, before, I, before I start talking about its effects on climate. So Antarctica, the, the continent, is covered in ice that 
you can think of it as it's always melting. It's, it receives, um, it grows as snow falls on it on the continent and, and the ice volume increases. But then as it increases, it flows out from the continent to the coast. And uh, that's where it loses mass. When the ice gets to the coast of Antarctica, it doesn't just drop into the ocean. Instead, it, uh, it forms these tongues that float out over the ocean. And these are called ice shelves. This is different to sea ice, which I mentioned before, which is just the surface of the ocean freezing. This is ice that's actually flowed from, from the land mass out onto the ocean. And you can see here the grounding line. That's what we call the point where the ice shelf leaves the ground essentially and, and becomes floating. Now this ice shelf is, is melting. Uh, the ocean water underneath it is warmer than the ice and, and causes it to melt. And it's also breaking up. It, it's losing, some of this ice is being lost as icebergs break off and, and float away and melt elsewhere. So the question is, is the amount that the ice is growing by on the land equal to the rate at which it's being lost at the ice shelves through these melt and, and iceberg processes? In climate models, including in the NZESM, Almost, I think all climate models actually that we've based our climate projections on assume that this is the case. However, glaciology tells us that um, it's pretty unlikely that this is the case. And actually the ice shelves, although they're all behaving differently around Antarctica, as there are diff local differences, the, the rate at which they are losing ice is speeding up. So this begs the question, well, does it matter? Does it make any difference to what we predict for climate? Is this something that we should be worried about putting into our model or does it actually make no difference? So how can we use the NZESM now that we've got our own climate model, the NZESM, how can we use it to look at this and see whether it's something that New Zealand should, should worry about? Well, we did an experiment where what we did was we ran the model for, to simulate a hundred years of climate and the plot on the right shows you along the x-axis the 100 years and along the y-axis is the ice that is lost from Antarctica. So over the period of 100 years we let the rate of ice loss increase from Antarctica. That was increasing both the number of icebergs and the, the rate of melting of the ice shelves. And we did a similar experiment where we kept everything, so we compared this to an experiment where everything else was kept exactly the same and we just left the, the rate of ice loss from Antarctica as constant, which is what our climate projections are, are based on, on that assumption. So we didn't increase greenhouse gas emissions. We didn't increase anything else. We just wanted to look at what, what difference does, does this changing, um, changing melt rate make? And actually it turns out it makes quite a big difference. So this is the change in sea ice thickness that we see so the, the frozen surface of the ocean, how, how much, what's the volume of ocean that we're freezing into ice? And we can see that it increases quite uh, dramatically. And we need to emphasize here that in our experiment, the, the rate at which we increase the ice loss from Antarctica is pretty huge. We were really interested in seeing, well, what happens? What's the effect? It's not necessarily realistic. It's really just to see what, what's the effect. Is it something we want to look at in more detail? So we see that it does make a big difference to, um, to the sea ice. Now, we wonder why, why would that be? Well, the meltwater, either from the ice shelves or from the icebergs, because although they break off as ice, ultimately they do melt into the ocean. And this fresh water is less dense than the salty ocean water that it melts into, which means it sits at the surface rather than mixing and, and sinking down into the ocean. And it sits at the surface. Firstly, it has a higher freezing temperature than the salty ocean water, so it's going to freeze more easily. But secondly, the atmosphere, which is always colder than the ocean, or pretty much always colder than the ocean around Antarctica, cools this surface water and, and freezes it. But if it was salty water, then as it cooled, it would sink, and warmer water would rise up to the surface and be cooled and sink and so on. So it takes much longer to cool the surface of, of the ocean than it does to cool the surface if you've covered it in fresh water because it just sits at the surface getting colder and colder and colder. So 
does that matter? Do, do we really care? Is sea ice something that we should worry about? All right, climate models might not do a great job at capturing it, but does that, does that matter? Well, yeah, it does. There are good reasons to worry about, about sea ice. So the first thing is the albedo effect. So this describes the reflectivity. So sea ice is a highly reflective surface, much more reflective than the, the black ocean surface or dark colored ocean surface, which means that solar radiation and solar energy entering the earth, a greater proportion of it is reflected back into space where you've got sea ice than, than if you've just got bare ocean. So that's one big impact on how much solar energy we're receiving. Another big impact is the ocean is warmer than the atmosphere, as I, as I mentioned, which means that the ocean surface cools down and the lower atmosphere warms up where they meet at, at the interface there. And this heat exchange is pretty important. But uh, if we put this insulating layer of ice in the way, then we stop that happening. So then we can start changing things, the ocean currents, we can start changing the heat of the ocean. So that's another pretty important impact. Another thing that some people have talked about that I don't know much about, but I just want to mention is the, uh, the buttressing effect that um, sea ice can, can have on ice shelves. So as I mentioned, ice shelves, as well as melting underneath, they're breaking up at the front and these icebergs are breaking off them. But if the ocean in front of the ice shelf is, is a frozen surface rather than water, then some people have suggested that this can actually make the ice shelf more, more stable. It sort of provides just that little bit of resistance to keep it together that little bit more easily. And then the last thing is salinity. So this is salt, basically. Um, when the ocean freezes, it's salty water freezing to make reasonably fresh ice. So as it freezes, it squeezes the salt out. And this salt makes the water round about much denser than it would otherwise be. And uh, we'll come back to that later, but that can be very important for, um, for ocean circulation. So another reason is uh, that we might care about this is that if we're showing that increasing the rate of ice loss from Antarctica causes us to have more sea ice, is there a possibility that this could offset the reduction in sea ice that our climate projections are saying will happen under, uh, under global warming? Are we exaggerating how much sea ice is actually going to be lost? So we compared our results to another experiment. And in this experiment, you can see that the top plot there shows you the thickening that we get from increasing Antarctic mass loss, the amount of ice being lost from Antarctica. And the lower plot shows the, the same thing, but in this case, it's thinning. That happens if we keep the, um, the rate of mass loss from Antarctica constant, as it is in our climate projections, but we allow carbon dioxide to increase by 1% every year. Then we see that we get, it's, it's almost, you know, well, it's the complete opposite effect. Um, so then we wonder well, what happens if we put these together? What happens if we increase carbon dioxide and we increase the rate at which ice is being lost from Antarctica? And we see here that, yeah, well, they, they kind of do offset each other. We get a pretty small change in total sea ice volume and the changes in thickness are much smaller. But again, I need to stress here that this study is really idealized and the, the rate at which we allowed ice to be lost from Antarctica is probably much higher than would happen in reality. So we can't really generalize these to say, oh, we don't need to worry, sea ice isn't gonna be lost. But what we can say is that it's maybe something that we need to take into account. So I mentioned salinity effects there, and this leads us on to, well, when sea ice freezes and, and squeezes out this salt and makes the water around about it denser and makes it sink, this can drive ocean circulation ocean circulation is pretty important. So if, we're cha if by getting the, the mass loss from Antarctica, if by changing that, we're changing the sea ice, are we actually going to change ocean circulation? I mean, that's getting on to pretty important stuff for global climate. So this is a picture really just to show you how the oceans of the world are, are connected. It's sort of a simplistic schematic showing how water travels around, um, around the Earth. And the point I want to get across is that as well as being a massive heat store for the planet, the ocean actually plays a really big role in distributing that heat around the planet. And so it's really important that we understand if anything is going to change 
in this circulation pattern because it means that how heat is distributed around the world is going to change. And sea ice could influence this because this is the process that I talked about where we make this, this denser water that sinks. Now in some places, if when sea ice forms, we get enough of this dense salty water forming and it, and it really is very dense, it can sink all the way to the ocean floor. If it sinks all the way to the ocean floor, we give it this name, Antarctic bottom water. And this is known to be one of the things that drives, or the main thing really, that drives the southern half of this um, ocean circulation pattern in the picture or the, the diagram. So under our climate projections for the future, we think the ocean's going to get warmer under, under global warming as, as things warm up. So we expect the ocean to get warmer so the water will be less dense and less likely to sink, but there'll also be less sea ice according to our projections. And if there's less sea ice, then there'll be less of this process going on to create this, um, this denser water. So we think there'll be a reduction in Antarctic bottom water. But if we've got the sea ice wrong, or if our sea ice projections aren't as reliable as we thought, then possibly our projections for Antarctic bottom water aren't as reliable as we thought. And that might mean that we're exaggerating this, this slowdown that we're expecting to see in ocean circulation maybe, maybe isn't going to be a slowdown after all. So we thought we'd have a look at that. Um, so unfortunately, <laughs> we didn't find that we could offset the changes to Antarctic bottom water production from global warming. So in the plot here, uh, we can see along the x-axis, we've got 100 years, that's the time of our experiment. The black line shows us when we've got a constant um, mass loss rate from Antarctica and we haven't got carbon dioxide increasing. So that's our business as usual case. And you can see that there is some variability in the Antarctic bottom water that's produced, but it doesn't go definitely up or down. It's, there is some variability there, but it's fairly constant. The gray line shows what happens to this dense bottom water production under um, if we increase carbon dioxide by 1% every year. And what we can see is that as we increase the carbon dioxide um, every year, then the amount of this dense water that's being produced goes down. And as I say, that's because we've got less sea ice and it's because the ocean is warming up. So the water is less dense that's being created by the sea ice in the first place. However, if we add a lot of fresh water, so we increase the amount of ice being lost from Antarctica, which essentially is adding a lot of fresh water to the ocean, because either we're melting the water at the ice shelves or we're melting the icebergs, but in either case, we're putting fresh water into the salty ocean and making the ocean much fresher. So although we're making more sea ice, this freshening means that the water is less dense. We're not we're not squeezing as much salt out of the water because there's less salt in it to squeeze out. So what we see is this yellow line here shows if we increase the mass loss from Antarctica, then even though we're increasing the amount of sea ice, we're still seeing a reduction in this dense water production, which is an example of how we're actually compounding the effect of uh, the effect we would attribute to, to a warming planet to increasing CO2. So just one more consequence that we thought it'd be, I thought it'd be interesting to share with you is a lot of people talk about surface temperature of the ocean. And this is another thing where the effect of the increasing, um, if we increase the rate at which ice is lost from Antarctica, we make the opposite effect to what we have if we increase um, CO2 emissions. So on the left here, we've got um, the surface cooling of the, of the world's ocean in our experiment where we are increasing the, um, the rate of ice loss from Antarctica, but we're keeping everything else constant. We're not increasing CO2. And on the right hand side, we keep the rate of ice loss from Antarctica constant, but we increase CO2 and we see the world gets warmer. So we wondered, well, could these offset each other? Can we maybe, do we maybe not need to worry quite so much about this, uh, this increase in surface temperature? So this plot here shows what happens if we allow carbon dioxide to increase 1% and we increase the rate of mass loss from Antarctica. Again, just to remind everyone, the rate at which we're increasing the ice loss from Antarctica is probably much higher than is realistic. This is just to see what happens. 
And what's interesting is in the Northern Hemisphere, well, nothing much really happens. In the Northern Hemisphere, the warming is pretty unaffected, really. Whereas in the Southern Hemisphere, although we still get the warming, it's less intense. And actually, when you come all the way down to New Zealand, then it's a lot less intense. And we've actually got an area of cooling around Antarctica. So this is an example of something where this is really interesting for New Zealand. This is really important that, that we understand this and that we get temperatures in, in our climate projections, that we get temperatures in these areas that we can really rely on. So maybe increasing mass loss from Antarctica is something that we want to worry about. So that's an example of um, how we can use the Earth system model. So use our own climate model to understand the, the impact of, of processes that are missing from the model and, and see whether they matter to us or not. But uh, having a ray model also means that we get a chance to make it better and, and improve the projections. So if we, uh, if we know things that are important to New Zealand climate and they're not in the model, well, we can try and put them in. So I'm going to give an example of something that we've been working on uh, to put into the model that isn't in there. And that's how new sea ice forms every year. Uh, so just to recap why sea ice is important, we've got this albedo effect where we change the amount of radiation that is reflected back to space. We've got ocean salinity, so salt um, making this dense water that can drive ocean circulation, possibly ice shelf buttressing, and we've got this heat exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere. So there are ways that uh, sea ice is important. And now I'm just going to try and show a video again, hopefully, to show you how. Yeah, so this is showing you sea ice around Antarctica from its maximum in September, just showing you going right through to its, its minimum. So every year sea ice melts and, and grows around Antarctica. It doesn't, doesn't just sit there all the time. And I also thought that you might quite like a break from me talking. So I thought I'd put a video on for just a, just a few seconds. You can see some holes starting to appear and uh, the ice breaking up. So its maximum is in September and its minimum occurs in, in March. So what we're looking at is how it goes from this minimum. If I just get back to the presentation. Oh, I Oh, no, I don't want that. There we go. Um, so what we're looking at is one of the ways in which sea ice grows every year, because that's a lot of ice that we've got to create every year and then lose again. So how, how does it form? And one of the ways that it forms is it grows from this thing that we call grease ice. I'm going to try and explain what this is. So we get super cooling in the ocean water. Now that means that we get water droplets that are colder than the freeze melt temperature of the water, which means that we get ice crystals forming in the ocean. And these ice crystals we call frazzle and they sit at the surface of the ocean and they form this sort of soupy slushy layer that we call grease. And it's made up of about, about a quarter ice crystals and about three quarters um, ocean water. Now if the sun is shining very strongly and the air temperatures warm up, this doesn't happen in the Antarctic, uh, but it happens in the Arctic more, then this grease layer may melt away. We may never actually make any sea ice from it. If the atmosphere is cold, then this grease layer will freeze and we'll have new sea ice. However, this might not happen straight away. The, the grease hangs around as this slushy stuff, sometimes for, for a few days. However, in our climate model, in the NZESM and in other climate models, this, this sort of greasy slushy layer, this intermediate stage is missed out. And instead what we do is we say, we've got these frazzle, these, these ice crystals that are formed in the water. They sit at the surface and we just say, well, that is new sea ice. We don't let it mix with the surrounding water. We don't let it hang about. It just is instantly new sea ice. Well, does that matter? Again, it's something we, we don't know. Why would it matter? Well, physically, it's not very satisfying because we know that, first of all, frazzle forms grease and then ice. We know there's this middle stage. But we also know that grease can persist for several days. And when it does freeze, this greasy slushy layer, 
the whole grease layer, including the water that's been incorporated into it, freezes to make new sea ice, not just the crystals that were in the that were formed from the supercooling. And then there's something called grease herding, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But at the moment, the, I want you to know the implications are that in our climate model, we've got sea ice growing too quickly and too thin, essentially. Um, and this has implications for all the effects we talked about, really. Um, and then we've also got this, uh, the grease herding that I said I'd explain. So if you have got some sea ice in the cell and some open water, then this slushy, greasy layer can be blown by the wind and sort of piles up against the edge of the sea ice. It's not spread nice and evenly over the hole in the ice. It's piled up against one edge of it, which means that even if it freezes, that hole might not be covered over by sea ice. We might still have some open water there. So again, if we're, if we're not including this process, then we're allowing holes in the sea ice to close too quickly. And this also has implications for all the same effects that that we've mentioned for sea ice before, for the albedo, for the ocean cooling, and so on. So what we're doing is looking at some work that these guys in the UK did, um, and we're trying to implement this into our climate model. This is a scheme to try and make it more realistic. So the frazzle volume, that's the volume of these ice crystals that form in the ocean from the supercooling. If there's no, uh, no open water, if the, if the grid cell is completely covered in sea ice, then they just freeze onto the sea ice and make it thicker. And that's really simple. However, if there is any water in the grid cell, it's not all covered in ice, then we use these ice crystals to make a grease layer that's a mixture of, of the ice crystals and, and of the water. And then if we've got some sea ice in the cell, as well as, uh, as, well as the grease now, then we can implement this herding effect. So this is what I talked about before. We don't allow the grease to become thicker than the existing sea ice. So if it's pushed up by the wind against the sea ice, then some of it can overflow onto the sea ice and, and thicken it. So this is how we calculate this area of, of slush and, and its thickness. And then we work out whether the atmosphere is going to melt it into the ocean and we don't get any sea ice at all or whether it's gonna freeze it solid into new, new sea ice. And it might be some of the grease or it might be all of the grease. And the end result is that we've made new sea ice and we might have some grease left over for the next time step. And the, the impact of this will be that in our model, we should slow down how, how, um, how quickly we create new sea ice. So we should be able to make sea ice more slowly, which will be more realistic. And it should form more thickly and, uh, and that's also more realistic. And our, the holes in the sea ice should persist for longer. So hopefully that'll make all these effects that we know sea ice has on climate slightly more reliable in the model. So those are my examples of, of things we can do with the ENSA DSM and our own climate model. Now, I wanted to, I hope I've managed to give you an overview of climate models are, well, they are very, very clever, but they aren't perfect and they can't ever be perfect. But they're very, very useful nonetheless, but only if we can understand what they do well and what they don't do well. If we try and use them too simplistically, they will not be as useful. And I wanted to put some, some quotes up from a, a famous, uh, famous modeler. I think any modelers listening will, will probably know these quotes from George Box in the 70s. So all models are wrong, but some are useful. That's the really famous one. The slightly less famous quote on the right is, uh, is what I want to talk about. What we're trying to do here is, since we know that all models are wrong, we want to be alert to what is importantly wrong. It is not appropriate to be concerned about mice when there are tigers abroad. <laughs> and that is essentially what we're trying to do, work out what's importantly wrong. And with the NZDSM, we've got this brilliant laboratory to work with, and it will help us to understand our climate projections better, which means we can make better decisions because if this is the evidence we're basing our decisions on, we really need to understand it well. And then secondly, we can actually improve the model and make better projections. And these are another couple of quotes from George Box, but I'm just going to end there. And actually, I'll leave it on those quotes in case anyone wants to look at them. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much, Shona. That was such a wonderful presentation um, and um, shorter than um, some of our other presentations have been, meaning that we have lots of time for questions and answers. Um, just to clarify what I said at the beginning of the seminar, you're not actually able to raise your hand in this uh, particular format of Zoom, which seems to change at whim, uh, but you can use the question and answer panel at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, not sure why we're not seeing anything, Fiona, here at Wellington, but anyway. Um, also, if you're in a physical hub, which is Otago, Wellington and Christchurch, you can raise your hand wildly and we will unmute that room and you can ask a question. So does anybody have a question for Shona today? David Rat, thank you. You might need to come up here actually and speak speak into this microphone because we've turned the ceiling mic off. Oh, first of all, thank you very much, Shona. That was a very uh, illuminating talk. I found it very interesting. The question I had for you was, that if I understood things correctly, when you did your what if, uh, you specified the rate at which you lost ice from the ice sheet. I guess what would be really nice would be if a model could actually uh, project that. What is the hope of actually doing that in future? Well, I think, yeah, it's sort of the the biggest missing piece in, in, a, in a climate model at the moment, because we do try and model everything in theory, but we don't model in general the ice sheets. And the way to the way to get the, the rate of mass loss from the, the ice sheet correct and allow it to, to interact so as precipitation changes and it, and it grows and as the ocean gets warmer so we increase the melt or if it gets colder somewhere else we decrease it and so on. The way to do it is to, to couple a dynamic ice, ice sheet model. There is work going on to do that. I'm not sure if they're running it yet but in the UK, they are coupling, they can couple a model for Greenland where the ice sheet was much smaller, but um, I'm not sure how far they've got with coupling the model for the Antarctic ice sheet yet. Um, but that is the plan. Unfortunately, for most climate modelling centres, that's not something that realistically will ever really, well, is likely to any time soon be achievable, just because of the huge resources that are needed in order to... Um, in order to dynamically model all the processes that go on in the ice sheet. There is work being proposed um, to sort of do sort of halfway house type things where you can make the, the change of the mass loss from Antarctica spatially variable around the coast. Um, so you can allow it to increase in some places and you can allow it to, to not increase in other places. These sort of halfway house things are, are being looked at and, and will be good, but unfortunately, the, the right thing to do um, is just computationally really, really beyond most people's resources. Thank you, Shona. Uh, we have a question from uh, Chauvin O'Farrell. Um, how large was your land ice anom anomaly compared to that used in other studies, for example, the Helmer or Fife studies? You, you mean how, how much did we increase the mass loss by? So the... Um, the rate that we started at, the rate of mass loss from Antarctica that we started at, is what's used in, in the climate projections um, in CMIP-6 that, that come out of the UK Earth System model. And that's a number, it's 1,770 gigatons a year. And that's the number that was required when they did a, a pre-industrial run for 100 years to keep the ice sheet in mass balance for the amount of precipitation that was being, being received. Um, the amount we increased it by was such that over the course of 100 years, we ended up increasing it by a factor of 10. So it really was quite a, quite a sledgehammer. Okay, and another question from Chauvin. Uh, in relation to the Greece ice in Polymnes, how similar is that to Wilmot's work? They did try and include that in early versions of LIM. Excuse me, I'm not sure of these acronyms. I'm not sure if it's used in current ones. Does that make sense, Shona? Sort of, yeah. So um, there have been efforts to include these processes in sea ice models. So a climate model, as well as being a virtual laboratory of the whole world, is made up of components that are, can usually be run in standalone mode 
or coupled just to each other. So you can have an ocean sea ice model and instead of modeling the atmosphere, you just tell it what the atmosphere is doing, for example. And uh, people have managed to put grease ice processes into coupled ocean sea ice models, but not into fully coupled ocean sea ice atmosphere models as, as far as I know, or as far as we've been able to find here. Um, and some of the parameterizations that are used for some of the, the ways it's been done, have, people have made attempts, but there've been a lot of simplifications involved. And I don't think it's been done in a, in a fully coupled model before. We're using SICE, which is a sea ice model similar, well, not similar, but it's used in place of LIM, which is what the questioner refers to. It's another, another sea ice model. Thank you, Shona. Does anyone else in a physical room have a question they'd like to ask by waving? That was me. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, that might um, draw us to a close, Shona, so you're off the hook. <laughs> Thank you so much again for presenting today. Uh, we will be um, uploading the video of today's seminar to YouTube and making it available on our channels tomorrow if you want to uh, pass that on. And uh, don't forget, if you haven't already signed up to our mailing list in order to find out about these seminars, you can do so at our website, deepsouthchallenge.com.co.nz, sorry. And, uh, and we'll hope to see you back here in the Zoom room on October the 23rd. Thank you very much. <laughs>